I can't. But 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 I can't. Welcome everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Louis Skippers and I'm the lead pastor at Grace Church and I'm so glad to share a series with you, um, a series about which I'm very excited because I feel like God wants to do something in us and through us that maybe we've been saying, God, we, we don't want to allow that yet because somehow we think that we can't step into what God is calling us into. And I want to share a little bit of a, a bit of my own story. For those of you who were here last week, I shared something of, um, of my call to, to enter ministry, how it came in a, the final confirmation of that came in a really low place in my life. But here's, here's an interesting continuation of that story. <clears throat> so after God called me again, I went to study theology full-time in, in, what was it, 2005, and during my first year of theology, so I have said, God, I give you everything. I will, like, dedicate my life to what you are calling me to, and during that first year, I encounter a whole bunch of things. Um, first of all, I walk into a seminary where I thought I would really be um, encouraged, and half of our professors are really liberal in their theology, so they don't believe the basic orthodox principles of Christianity. And that developed into a fight that I kind of became a, a key component in that, that was really weighed heavy on me as a, as a very young man. Secondly, I started dating a girl that studied with me that I 100% believe this would one day be my wife. And that relationship ends up in a very, very horrible way, break up. Um, in the meantime, I'm working part-time to try, try to make money to pay for my studies, and my job just goes south in every way possible. So now I'm working during the week in the evenings at a job in marketing where suddenly I'm earning no money, and then I'm working on the weekends to just get money for gas so that I can go to my job in the week that's making me no money. And <clears throat> just on top of that, in a matter of two months or so, in June, July, while I'm I'm um, in my winter break in South Africa. One of our best friends, someone that was, uh, had a really, really prominent um, place in my life, gets murdered on his farm. My dad and I are the first on the scene, and I pick him up on his porch right after he was shot through the heart. And that led me to so many different questions just this series of little things that happened that I got to a point where I didn't necessarily stop believing that there is a God. I just couldn't believe that that God could be for me if so many things in my life that I dedicated to Him went wrong. And I actually said, I'm going to stop studying theology. My parents spoke to me a bit, but um, if I, I'm pretty hard-headed. So if my mind is made up on something, you're not going to change it. And the longer that period progressed, the more I searched for answers, um, the more questions developed until finally I said, like, I, I'm not sure I, I can follow this Jesus any longer. And here is the sad part in that story is that the more I withdrew from Jesus, the more things in my life just felt like I had, the more it felt like I had zero purpose, I had zero direction. I didn't know what I want to do with my life anymore. I didn't know where I'm going. Like, everything started to feel like it's falling apart. Until one day, I had this, this sense, this feeling deep inside of me that I have lost every single thing that is precious to me in my life. And I can still remember that prayer that I prayed that day as if it was yesterday. And I prayed and I said, God, it's fine. Keep the answers. As long as I have you, because when I had you, at least I had something in my life. Now I feel like I've got nothing. And that was a moment where I chose to surrender some of the questions in my life in order to gain something so much greater than all of these questions 
could ever, if they were answered, give me? And I don't know if you've ever been in that place in your spiritual walk where your heart might be saying yes to Jesus, but your head is so full of questions, you're so confused about so many things that that there's this war that's waging between your heart that wants to say yes, whether that is something God is calling you to, whether that is God calling you to enter a relationship with Him. Somewhere in your heart you feel like you should say yes, but your head is just saying no. Your head is paralyzing your spiritual walk. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. <clears throat> our second topic in our series, I Can, is, but I have too many questions. God, I want to... I want to say yes, but I have too many questions. And we'll be reading today another piece from the life of Moses. We started last week where God is calling him into this place where God says, like, Moses, I want to use you to proclaim freedom, to bring freedom to my people in Egypt that were all slaves. And Moses makes five excuses. And we're looking at those excuses and how they relate to our own life. And we're going to continue reading about that today. But I first want to give you this challenge again. I said last week, we believe at Grace Church that this is not enough. You need and I need to be self-feeders. So we need to read God's word ourselves. So our challenge was, let's read three chapters of the book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible, every week. Um, hopefully it started last week. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, you can download it on your phone. Or as you leave the auditorium doors on the left, there's a little shelf. There's a bunch of new international version um, Bibles there. Just take one if you need one. And um, hopefully you read chapter 1, 2, and 3 this week. That would bring you to this point where God is asking him to go. And then this week I want to challenge you to read chapter 4, 5, and 6. So the next three chapters... Um, if you didn't do it, it's still time to catch up. It's one chapter a day for six days. It's not super long. Um, so please read his story with us, and it will just put everything that we're talking about here into such greater perspective. But we'll be reading today from Exodus 3. We continue. Last week we stopped at verse 12. Today we're continuing in verse 13. So God just said, Moses, I want to send you on what was Moses' answer, but I'm a nobody, God. Like, how can you send me? And then... Um, after God has answered him, this is Moses, his response to God in verse 13. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. So go. Assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and I've seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of the misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, the Etites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will, God says, listen to you. And then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know, God says, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. And after that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor, and any woman living in her house, for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians." There is a moment in the second but of Moses where his heart and his mind clash. Here how he starts his answer to God. He's, suppose I go. 
So he's not saying, no, God, I will not go. He's saying like something deep inside of me is telling like maybe I should go. So he says, God, I think I want to go. Like my heart is saying yes, but my head is saying, wait a moment. I have a lot of unanswered questions that I first need to sort out. And maybe you've been feeling like that in your spiritual life where maybe you haven't made a decision to surrender your life to Jesus yet. And deep inside of you, you feel like I want to do this but your head is still full of questions. Maybe God is asking you to make a change in career or to spend more time with Him or to change the way you parent your children or to the way that you are a loving partner to your spouse. Maybe God is asking you to step up out of your comfort zone and to serve Him. Maybe God is asking you to go and set people free, just like He asked Moses to go and set the Israelites free, Jesus asked us to go and to proclaim His gospel to make disciples. And you're saying, my heart wants to, but my head is still saying, I have too many questions. Often when we have questions, it leads us to opt for no action. This is the sad part for me. When I'm in a place where my heart is saying yes, but my head is saying, wait a moment, I've got questions. Instead of following my heart, we often follow our minds, our brains. It's like, but I've got questions. And those questions lead us to not taking any action. And what I want you to see this morning before we read the rest of the story is that every action or inaction has a reaction. So when we choose to not act on that which God is calling us into, there is an action, there is a consequence to that. What if Moses didn't go? If Moses didn't go, there would have been no freedom for the Israelites. The people that God chose to say, like, I want to show the world who I am through these people, they wouldn't have even existed if God didn't free them, if Moses didn't respond to God's call. What if the church... That is Christians, all of us coming together. What if the church stops going? What if we stop responding to the, to the call of God? What happens is that the world remains stuck in brokenness. That the world remains stuck in pain and sin and separation and hopelessness. And all of the consequences of that brokenness. You see, what we do is we love to complain about what's going on around us. And hear this. This is not a cultural thing in Canada, and it's not a cultural thing in South Africa. It is part of the human condition. When I was in South Africa, we all complained about crime and having, not having electricity all the time, and our president, and we complained about all of that. I get to Canada. Guess what people complain about here? Our prime minister, and they complain about the schooling system, and we complain about the snow that's not being removed, and we complain about the, the decay of of our morals. We love to complain about stuff. But here is the thing. People are only moving within the restraints of their bondage. Our world is broken and it is in bondage if it does not know Jesus and it is moving within the restraints of that bondage and it doesn't help for us to complain about the world moving in those restraints. What Jesus is calling us to is to set them free, but if we don't respond, what's the consequence? What if you don't respond to His call to your life? What if you don't respond to His call to say, I want you to commit to be here, to be part of my church, my bride that I love so much? What if you don't respond to His call where He's saying, I don't want you to sit in a pew on a Sunday and keep it warm. I want you to be part of this. I want you to serve. I want you to give. I want you to help change the world. What if you don't respond to His call to step up as a husband, to step up as a father and to start leading the way that God is asking you to lead. There's consequences to that. What if you don't open your life to him? Well, he's, he's saying like, I want to I wanna give you a life that you can't even imagine, but you're saying my head is so full of questions, I'm not going to surrender to Jesus. I want to tell you today that the consequences of not taking action is that we miss out on God's purpose for our life. We miss out on the freedom and the beauty and the hope that can only be found in Jesus when we're unwilling to respond to His call. So I don't know about, I don't know what questions are preventing you from moving into the call that God has for your life. 
There are some general ones that you get all the time. And I don't know what the questions are that might be unique to you that you feel like this is something I'm struggling with that's preventing me. But I want us to look at Moses and his question, his excuse of not knowing enough. In verse 13, he says, God, what if I go and they ask me who sent me? Like, I, I don't know what to do. Now, this might seem like a very valid question, but here is my question, if you dig a little deeper. Did Moses really not know who God was? If you did your reading this week, chapter 1 to chapter 3, you would have seen that when Moses was walking randomly in, in, in the fields with his sheep, he saw a burning bush that started talking to him, and the voice told him, Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God of your ancestors. And Moses knew exactly who this God was, and he actually hid his face because he was afraid to be in the presence of God. The same God that he learned about when his own mother raised him for the Pharaoh's daughter that found him in the river. See, his true question wasn't like, God, who are you? I think his true question was, God, I might go, but I still have a lot of questions that are unanswered. And in that question that he asks, I think there is something inside of him where he believes that he doesn't know enough about God to fully represent him. He, doesn't, he feels like he doesn't know enough about God to truly put his trust in him. Because he wasn't completely unwilling. He's like, suppose I go. Like, I'm considering this. He just felt like his questions prevented him from taking that step. And a lack of knowledge, a lack of, of answers to the questions we ask leave us with a bunch of uncertainty, and that prevents us from responding to God's call in our life. Think about this for a moment. Like, how long... Do you have to be a Christian before you finally step out in faith and start living that way? Before you start sharing your faith? Before you start serving His kingdom? Before you start making it about God first instead of yourself? Like how long? Five years? Ten years? Twenty years? Like when does how we follow Jesus suddenly change? It doesn't change. There's no time limit. We don't need to reach a certain point before we reach we graduate to a point. How, how many times do you have to read through the Bible before you can finally say, yes, God? Do you need a theological degree? How many times does God need to knock on the door of your heart to say, stop being stubborn. I want to help you. I want to heal you. I want to save you from yourself before you go like, yes. Something interesting is happening in the world at the moment. Stuff that I've been reading about for years and that I've preached about at Ashbury University, and some of you probably saw it in Kentucky. Um, on Wednesday, the 8th of February, a bunch of students came together for their chapel period, for their, for their chapel, and um, one kid got up and started confessing his sin just randomly in front of everyone, and no one wanted to leave. And now, days after that, that chapel period has not stopped. And now it started to spread to other universities and people and some of my friends in the U.S. as well are flocking there to see what's going on and people from across the world are literally flying in to see what's going on and I get so excited because I'm like, there is this hunger to follow God. There is this hunger to say, Holy Spirit, come and do something in me. There is a hunger to say yes to God, but at the very same time, a whole bunch of of people in the Christian world is just criticizing it and saying it's from the devil and saying how wrong it is and how we cannot know if this is actually revival. And I'm like, how do we get to that cynical of a point in our spiritual walk? And let me tell you how we get there. Our lack of understanding, a lack of knowledge of just who God's spirit is and how he moves, a lack of understanding how God can do whatever he wants when he wants brings us to a place where we cannot accept the stuff that we cannot understand. Here is the actual problem. It's not just the questions, it's the fear that comes with the questions. It is the fear to be proven wrong. It is the fear to say yes and then to find out that I didn't succeed. 
That is what brings us to a point where we don't say yes. I'm afraid. And I want to tell you today, don't let fear of not knowing, don't let fear, this uncertainty of not having an answer to every question in your life prevent you from acting what you do know. Moses actually knew more than enough to act. He knew that there was a burning bush that didn't burn out, and a voice spoke out of it. I'm like, come on. He knew who this God was, because God said, I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He knew that this God was sending him. But his fear that stemmed out of this place where he's like, God, I have so many questions. Like, I don't know if I can go yet. That fear prevented him from taking action. But God gives him an answer, a three-word answer. And I believe that three-word answer can answer every single question you have in life. Everyone. God's answer is this. I am who I am. You might be like, that's five words. I know in in Hebrew it's not, it's three words. So let me geek out for a moment and tell you the value of this. Up to that point, people didn't know God's name, and often we say that is the moment God revealed His name, but actually God didn't give His name there exactly. This is God's name in the Jewish Old Testament, Yahweh. This is without the vowels. That was only added by the Masoretes years and years later. So initially they only wrote the consonants. Now if you look at the word I am that appears there, and you read this from right to the left, by the way. But if you look at that word, you will see that only the first letter, the letter on the right, changes, because it comes from Yahweh, comes from the same root as this word. The word that appears there is Eye, same consonant, just the first word that changes, that adds the the first person um, common singular. And both Yahweh and I am comes from the root word. You can see those three letters there. A he, a vav, and a he. So haya. And this is what it means. When you add that first person, common singular, haya means to be, to become, to come to pass. But when you add that first person singular to it, it means I am, as we translate it, or I who is, or I who causes to exist. And in those three words, I am who I am, God answers every question that Moses could ever have. This is what it means, okay? God's very, God's very name, God tells him, Moses, I have no beginning. No one created me. And I have no end. I cannot come into being. I did not come into being. And I cannot go out of being. God is telling him that I am the absolute reality. There is nothing outside of me. I don't depend on anything. But everything depends on me. Because through me, I am the one through which everything comes into being. God says, I am constant because I have no end and I've got no beginning. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, I am exactly the same. God cannot be improved. He does whatever He pleases. He's always right. He's always beautiful. And it's always according to His truth. He is free from every single constraint that didn't originate from Himself. God is telling him he's the most valuable reality and person in the universe. He's saying this is how you summarize it all, what God is telling Moses with those three words. God is saying, Moses, I am like nothing you know in existence. I am not like any king of Egypt. I am not like any God you've ever heard of. There is something about me that you will never comprehend because there is nothing in existence that can even come close to me. Nothing that was and nothing that ever will be. He's telling him, Moses, you cannot have all the answers because you cannot even fully comprehend my name. It's too great. See, this just tells me 
that there is this mysterious certainty to be found in God. It is mysterious because it is so much bigger than our understanding can comprehend. But there is this certainty because nothing can be without God. God is telling Moses, Moses, you don't have and you don't need all the answers because in me you have every single answer you could ever need. You don't need to have every question answered before you take action because in God, you have every answer you could ever need. In God, you realize that God is not just a man-made concept, is not just something we think out, is not something we can touch. He's a superhuman Savior. He goes above and beyond our very comprehension. But God knew that even that part Moses couldn't fully comprehend, so God breaks it down to him in verse 15, where God says, listen, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what God is telling him is exactly what he told him now. God is saying, like Moses, look back to the past, like even before creation, but just like in this past that you can remember and see that the same God who chose your ancestors is here today choosing you. The same God who was faithful then is the one who's faithful now. He makes him look to the past to gain courage for the present. And then God says, from generation to generation, this will be my name. So God is reaffirming that there is no end to who he is. It doesn't matter if it's 2,000 years later, we are still proclaiming the same name of God. Because he doesn't change, not in the present and not in the future. He's always faithful. He never changes. He's always dependable. And what God is telling Moses, you don't need every answer, but if you look at the centuries of faithfulness, realize that you don't need it. Because just as I provided then, I will provide now. And guys, I just want to say this straight out. As people living in the 21st century, we have no excuse to not take action, to allow our questions to override our faith and trust in Him. Because you think like, oh Moses, you were so lucky, like God spoke to you, you saw a burning bush, like that's so cool, you could have had certainty out of that. Let me tell you what we have. We have a much better revelation than Moses could ever have. When Jesus came to earth, later, He revealed God's perfect image in a way that we could for the first time comprehend. The Bible says He is the perfect image, the perfect representation of God. We cannot know God outside of Jesus because our minds are too limited. He is the perfect revelation of the Father. And therefore, not only do we have this faithful testimony, but we've got eyewitness accounts of people that saw Jesus, that saw the resurrected Jesus. And for centuries, we've been following this God who's been faithful. We've got a perfect revelation in Jesus of God. Whether we have answers or not, If we are willing to say, God, in you, I have an answer because you are greater than all my questions. I know I cannot comprehend every answer because then I would have to be able to comprehend this God who is so much bigger than this world we're living in. If we're willing to trust Him, God goes on from verse 16 to 22 to make a promise to Moses. And He's like, Moses, you won't have every question every answer. In me you have every answer, and this is what I will do for you. I will go ahead of you, and I will prepare the way for you. Hear what he says, verse 16 to 18. He says, go to them. Go and speak to them. They will listen. You see, the question could have been, would they listen to me? God God just knew that would be a question, so God just answered it for him. And God tells him, I am ahead of you, preparing the hearts of the people before you even say, Foot in Egypt again. Verse 19 to 20. And we'll just get have gone, but the Pharaoh is not going to listen. God is like, uh, 
before he even asks, I know the Pharaoh is not going to listen. I know his heart, so I will compel him to listen. Before you even ask a question, a question you didn't even know will exist, God has already answered it because God is ahead of him already. In verse 21 to 22, Moses would have probably, after the Pharaoh said, go, he could have probably said, but how we are slaves, we've got nothing. We cannot take this long journey. Before Moses could even think of that question, he goes like, oh, by the way, like the Egypt's, Egyptians are just going to give you guys stuff. You're going to go out of that country and your pockets will be full. And see, God is saying, I'm ahead of you. I have your future in my hands. God knew every question that Moses hadn't even thought of yet. And he had an answer for each one of those. I want to tell you, just like God knew Moses, just like he knew the hearts of the Israelites, the heart of Pharaoh, God understands your heart, your heart. God understands your questions. He understands your needs. He cares about your future, and he is more than enough. For any question you could ever have. I had to come to that point in my life back then where I said, God, you, if I have you, I have more. But without you, all I have is questions. And I surrendered my questions in that moment to have something that was greater than the value of the answers. And I might not still have answers to every single question I have, but I don't care about it that much anymore because I have seen that God does have answers to even my non-verbalized questions and that He's ahead of me. I shared a little bit of where, before we came to Canada, but before we came, this was the prayer in my heart. I said, like, God, I, I do not know this country. I do not know the culture. So all I can pray and all I can trust in is that you will be in Canada changing the hearts of people before me. I didn't come here without questions, but I came here with certainty. Because the one who called me is greater than the questions in my life. A willingness to follow God despite our lack of knowledge and understanding. That is what faith is all about. That is where we put our trust in Jesus despite, despite the fact that my rationale can't figure it all out. Despite that math can't figure it all out or science can't figure it all out. That is saying, like, God, I'm putting my trust in you who are so much bigger than all of that. And quite frankly, I don't want to serve a God that's smaller than that. Because then I might as well serve a brick. Or another human. I want to serve a God who's bigger, who transcends my understanding and my reason and this world and this age. So are you going to allow, will you allow your lack of understanding to forever keep you from stepping into the purpose that God has for your life? Are you going to allow your lack of understanding to prevent you from surrendering your life to Jesus and living a life to the fullest with Him? Are you willing to sacrifice your marriage or your children because you do not want to say yes to Jesus just because you have some questions in your heart? Are you willing to just remain a bystander in what God is doing in this world? Because He's already called you to step up, but you're unwilling to trust Him in that call. I don't want to. I want to say yes, despite my questions. Let's pray. Jesus, you know our hearts. You know the questions we wrestle with, the doubts we have, the answers we're looking for. And how those 
questions and the fear of being wrong so often paralyzes us in our walk with you. God, we cannot even fully comprehend your name, never mind who you are. And I pray that in these moments, in this day, that your greatness and your splendor and your beauty and your your eternal character, that who you are will just overshadow every question we have. Because in you, there is a life where the questions doesn't even matter anymore. A life that transcends it. A life that is so much more beautiful than my questions or my doubts or my pain. I pray that for everyone sitting here this morning. Everyone watching online. I pray, Jesus, that we would surrender. That we would lay our questions before you. And that in that same simple description of who you are, I am who I am, that we will find a mysterious certainty that transcends our very understanding. I do not want to move on from this point this morning, so I want to ask everyone in the room to just keep their eyes shut. Benny's going to start playing for us in the background. We've got a class after this step into faith. With this next step of baptism, when we decide to follow Jesus, the logical step, the next step that He asks of us is to be baptized. Maybe you're here this morning and you haven't taken that step of obedience. What is keeping you back? Maybe you're here this morning and and you're still sitting so comfortable, just growing in, in head knowledge. But you haven't stepped out to live the mission of Jesus. What is keeping you back? Surrender it to Him. But some of you are here this morning and you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus yet. Because although He's knocking at the door of your heart, although you have this sense that life is better with Him than without Him, all of the questions that you're struggling with cannot let you take that next step. Why are you allowing that to keep you back? Are you struggling with your brokenness and your sin, your questions on your own? So this morning, with all of our eyes closed, I want to give opportunity to you if you're saying, I'm I'm done questioning. I want to surrender to Jesus. You don't have to walk out of here this morning on your own. You can walk out of here with Jesus in your life. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you confess with your mouth that you are saved. So if you need a savior this morning and you're done with your questions, I want to ask you to make that bold decision this morning. If you want to surrender your life to Jesus, I just want to ask you to write there where you are. Not just, not, to not just give this little tiny hand raised with that no one can see. I want to ask you to be bold this morning and say, despite my fears and my questions, I'm going to raise my hand up high. And I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus. If you need to do that, I want to invite you this morning to just raise your hand. If you're watching online, I want to ask you to, in your box, in the comment box, just type in, I'm surrendering to Jesus. This is how simple it is. You can pray this with me. It's all that's needed. Prayer before Jesus. I surrender my life to you this morning. On my own, I am lost. I am broken. And I have more questions than I can ever find answers to in my own. 
This morning I surrender to you, Jesus. My Lord, my Savior who's paid for my sin on a cross. In whom I can find forgiveness. In whom I find eternal life. In whom I find meaning and purpose. Jesus, take control of my life. Be my King. Be my Savior. I believe. Amen.